Thank you, Peter. My name is Anne Downton, and I'm the convener of the MAV um, 20 virtual conference. And I'm delighted that we've been able to um, bring this conference to you this year, given everything that's happened. This morning, I'll be your host. My role is to introduce the presenters and um, also to provide any announcements. And if you have any technical issues, please check your confirmation email for troubleshooting and who to contact for support. So let's begin. This is room two and our keynote presenter for this morning is James Tanton. And James will take some questions after the session, but would you please provide your questions in the chat in advance so that we can maximize the time we have with James afterwards. Before I pass you on to James, I'd like to introduce Penny Addison from the Department of Education and Training who are sponsoring our keynote today. Hi, I'm Penny Addison, uh, the Director of the Curriculum and Assessment Branch at the Department of Education and Training. And it's my great um, joy this morning uh, to uh, introduce you to James uh, Tanton, who is going to be delivering a keynote um, address. James is, uh, is very interesting uh, to myself and to my colleagues at the department uh, because he focuses his work on mathematics being everywhere and for everyone and mathematics being fun um, and something that can inspire um, in, in all of us this sense of wonder and awe. And, you know, funnily enough for the work we do, um, when people often think about mathematics, this is the last thing they think about. Uh, we know that lots of kids um, get anxious about mathematics and sometimes our teachers do. So, you know, uh, James's work is really interesting because it, it, it paints a picture of the light on the hill of what mathematics can be, um, potentially if we approach it um, a little bit differently. Um, one of the other things um, that we really uh, love about James' work is really thinking about how we can be more discerning about our curriculum choices. And I think, you know, this uh, resonates very strongly with some of the work um, that we are exploring, which is not all parts of the mathematics curriculum are equal. Um, and we can, we can certainly um, pick out the bits uh, that are core um, to the learning progress and really focus relentlessly on those. And hopefully, uh, you know, through some of those pedagogical choices and other design choices, uh, make it fun and engaging for learners, which is very, uh, you know, important in the effective domain. Uh, but equally, um, you know, get that deep learning and that deep conceptual understanding. Um, so it is with great pleasure that I introduce um, James to you today. Um, and I, I'm sure, and you also uh, will really look forward to his talk. Well, g'day Australia. This is James here. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. What an honor to be here to speaking for my homeland. So thank you so much for having me today. This is a real pleasure and honor indeed. Oh, golly gee. So let's, let's begin. I've got a very important question to ask folks in my homeland. Is everyone back in Australia fully aware that there is an international salute to mathematics? Do you know there's a math salute? Now, I can't see you, unfortunately. Hopefully some of you are saying yes. Hopefully all of you are saying yes, but I suspect some people are saying no. There's an actual salute to mathematics that's done all around the world. And I feel duty bound to begin today's session by actually teaching the math salute. That's the only thing I really care about today. Before we begin with the keynote presentation, I must give you the math salute. So let's do it together. So it's morning in Australia. It's the afternoon in Phoenix right now. So I'm going to put down my, my juices and stuff. But you need to put down your coffee cups and tea cups because you need your arms completely free for the salute. It's very strange. So watch out. And it begins as follows. So arms free. Okay. Start the salute as follows. Put your arms out front. Okay, make your hands look really big on the camera. Ooh. Then it goes right hand over left hand. Then the salute goes palm to palm. And then it gets weird. You wiggle your little fingers. Then you wiggle your thumbs. Then you wiggle your little fingers one more time. And then when you're ready, just come on back. Whoa, whoa. Did you try it? Fact, fact, try it again. Fact, I'll do it sideways from a different angle. You can see what's going on. But this is mighty tricky. Start as follows. Arms out front. Right hand over left hand. So you see I'm not cheating. It really is my right hand over my left hand. Palm to palm. Wiggle the little fingers. Wiggle the thumbs. Wiggle the little fingers. And when you're ready, just come on back. Just come on back. Wow. Now, I'm not making this up. This truly is an international salute to mathematics. If you Google international math salute, you will indeed find this. So I've given you a problem. Now, unfortunately, I can't see you. Would you like me to give away the answer? Type into the chat either yes or no if you'd like me to give away the answer right now because I'm feeling generous for my homeland today. 
So I've got my friend Anne who gets to monitor the chat for me and she's gonna tell me what's the most prevalent answer, either a yes or a no. Let's give it a go. So Anne, when the answers start rolling in, let me know what people want. They want me to give it away or they like me to keep it a secret. Oh, and just so you know, we have a little bit of delay on my video speaking and, and your chat ability. So that's why I'm pausing a little bit right now. But some answers are better coming in. I'll do it one more time whilst we're waiting. Do -do -do, do -do -do. Palm to palm. Wiggle the little fingers. Wiggle the thumbs. Wiggle the little fingers again. And when you come on back, you can do it. Come on back. Crazy, crazy. All right, any, any responses, Anne? Is it working for us today, this chat? Maybe not, maybe not. Not at the moment. All right. All right, then here's what I shall do. I'll give a half a solution, I will half help. I will actually give a piece, a half a hint to this particular salute. So those that are watching, I will help us out a little bit. So compromise between the yes and the no. So this seems very gimmicky, I know, but actually there's a very important maths lesson in what I just did. I've given you a problem, that is how to do the salute. In fact, it's better than that. I've given you a problem and you know what the final answer is meant to be. The final answer is meant to be this untangled state. Okay, so here's a very important strategy in mathematics and in life sometimes. If you've got a problem and you know what the answer is meant to be, or at least have a good hint of what the answer should be, there's a very good strategy. It's so good, it's so simple, people even forget about it, but it's very powerful. You work backwards, start with the answer, and work backwards. Can we reverse engineer this? So start at the end, and can we go back to the beginning? So let's try it. So here's the answer you have to ask yourself, okay, where must this come from? Let's reverse engineer it. Well, it must have come from that. Okay, so far so good. Now my fingers are clasped here, now, now I'm not gonna ask, where did that come from? Well, it must have come from my fingers, unclasped, palm to palm. Now, if you're following me, you just realized you got to a very strange feeling middle position. That's a very funny feeling right now. Different from what you're probably doing. You start at the end and you get to this, whoops, start at the end, and you get this funny feeling middle position. Your challenge now, because I've half helped you out, can you now start at the beginning and somehow get to that same funny feeling middle position? So I'm clearly doing something. Wiggle, 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 come on back. So there's your challenge. So while I'm being particularly boring for the next 45 minutes or so, you can secretly practice this off camera, practice the math salute just to amuse yourself. And at the end, if you really want me to give it away, it can be one of the questions you're asking me, say, James, please give away the math salute. And I will, because I'm feeling very generous today. All right, so let me talk about today's, today's uh, uh, keynote presentation on the topic of exploding dots, which has become a bit of a global phenomenon. So I'm gonna share my screen. And like all people do when they're on live camera and Zooming and all the rest, they fumble while they share their screen. Let me fumble away. So where's my share button? There it is. Let's look for the thing I wanna share. There it is, and I'm pressing share. All right, so my camera is focusing. Hopefully we're in good stead now. You can now see this wonderful photograph of a student in Tanzania, Tanzania, who's actually doing this exploding dots experience, exploding dots. Uh, this student here is actually doing some long division purely visually, and she's figuring out some crazy long division problem just by playing with these exploding dots. So I wanna talk about exploding dots today. I'm probably gonna go a bit fast and do way more than you possibly take in for over a 45 minute experience. So just enjoy the experience in the moment. Don't worry about taking notes because everything, everything I do is actually at this website, globalmathproject.org. And you can see I've sort of become a little bit Americanized. I couldn't write maths project is global math projects. Watch out for the American math there. Um, everything is there, look at exploding dots. And now I am ready to start today's experience. Here goes, after all that fumbling, let go, let's go. So I'm gonna start by taking, making one comment about the English language. The comment about the English language is that English is weird. It's just weird. It really is just weird. In fact, even the spelling of weird is weird. Isn't it meant to be I before E, except after C, before E, except after C? Oh, something weird is going on. So even the spelling of weird is weird, right off the bat. So there we've got a problem right at the, at the point that the language I'm speaking in is weird. And it's also weird in matters of mathematics when it comes to even just writing, thinking, and how we visualize numbers. For example, let me take a big number like, I don't know, 273. So this number is actually, well, what I wrote, said just then, was 200, 270. So you see this is also a experience in hieroglyphics. My handwriting is appalling, so hopefully you're following my language as I speak. 
273. Well, that's fine. In fact, if, how I think about this is I think of this literally as ones, tens, and hundreds. It's two hundreds. 200. There they are. 7T. Now, that TY is in English is short for tens. So it's literally seven tens. There they are, seven tens and three. One, two, three. So there's nothing too weird about that. Seven, 273 is literally 200, seven tens and three. We say that, we even visualize that, we think that. No problem. Uh, 263 is actually fine. In fact, let me focus on that middle digit, 60. That is totally fine. That means six tens, six T, six tens. But when I go down a notch, like 200 and, well, this one, well, if you think about it, if I said 70 for that one, seven tens, and 60 for that one, six tens, I should say 5T. I should say 5T. If English is consistent, that's what I should say. But people say, no, James, don't be silly. No one says 5T. We changed the word completely to 50. Golly gee. All right, let's keep going then. It gets weirder. How about this one? Well, we should say 243. Oh, but we do say 43. Brilliant. But actually, it's a little bit weird. Say, James, you don't spell 40 really for you. That's for the number four, but not for 40. Please cross out that U. This is weird. Okay, how about this one? Here comes English. You can guess what we're meant to be saying there. We're meant to be saying 3T. But people think I'm weird. If I were to say 3T literally for three tens, no, 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 you're meant to make that 30, James. Please make that 30. How about this one? You know what I'm about to say. I want to say tutti. We should be saying tutti in English. We don't. We change the word completely to 20. Oh, or actually this next one, this one here. Of course, I want to say one T, but this one actually is kind of weird. In fact, let me give myself a whole new page for this one. There's 201 T3, because this one is exceptionally weird. I should be saying 1T, 1T, but we don't. We say 213. And if you think about that, that's a whole new level of weirdness because that picture would be literally this. If I have a little picture of like ones, places, tens, and hundreds, 200, okay, 200. There is no mention of tens, no mentions of tens of what we actually say. We never mention any tens. But we just say and 13 as an and 13 units. We literally say this, 213. That's literally what we say. So we write 200s, 110, and three. But we, don't, we might think that, but we don't say that. And people say, but hang on, hang on, hang on. You're not meant to have ten, more than 10 uh, ones, because 10 ones, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 of them, 10 ones is really the same as one of those. So it really should be two, one, three, which is what we write. We do write two, one, three is what it really should be. But my point is, it's not what we say. All I have to say is right now that English is weird. Have I mentioned that already? Because English is weird. Look about that right there. So how students learn and how we think and say numbers in English is kind of beyond me. In fact, actually, it's a good question here. So you can see I've actually worked on Units, ones, tens, hundreds. I guess the next one would be 10 hundreds makes a thousand, and then 10 thousands makes 10,000, and then 10 thousands makes 100,000. We seem to base our number system on tens. 10, one, 10, 10, tens, 10, 10, tens, 10, 10, 10, tens, and so on and so on. So here's my actually first question before I keep going with today, because I'm curious now. Why are we humans obsessed with the number 10 on matters of arithmetic and counting. We've based everything, it seems, on tenness. Why have we humans chosen the number 10? So, so curious, I'm curious, Anne, has the chat been able to work or not for you at this point? Not for me, unfortunately. No, okay, so I'm afraid this is gonna be a one-way experience. It's gonna be nothing but James talking all the time for you. I'm so sorry. Okay, that's good, that's good. In which case, I get to answer all my own questions. All right, so let's think about it. So I'll give you a moment to think about two in your own minds. Uh, why would we humans be assessed to the number 10? A lot of people say because it makes the arithmetic easy. Well, that's like a chicken and the egg sort of thing. Like, well, it's probably easy because we're just so used to it. Someone had to do it first. Why did whoever chose to do it first chose to do it in the first place? If you think about it for a while, we humans are obsessed with the number 10 because of our physiology. Our physiology. We've got two hands with these things on the ends of them that we've got these 10 digits 
fingers and thumbs that we find very natural counting. It seems very natural to count in tens because of our hands. In fact, I even said the word, we call that a finger, but we also call it a digit. We call that a digit, but we call each of these things a digit. And guess what? We call each of these individual numbers within a long number, a digit, the same word. It's not a coincidence. We are so obsessed with our hands on matters of, of arithmetic and counting because of this. We even use the word digit. So we humans work with base 10 because we like the number 10 for counting. Though, though I do need to point something out before I go on. There are some cultures that actually went base 20. They thought that 20 was a better number for counting than 10. And you think to yourself, like, why 10? Well, why 20? What were those people thinking? What, what were they thinking of that made, made them think that 20 was a good number? And they realized, they probably thought, oh, not only do we have fingers to count on, if you look down, or maybe you can see me, if you look down, you actually see fingers and toes. We have 20 digits in total, actually, fingers and toes. So some cultures actually went base 20. Actually, I can tell you, we have vestiges of base 20 to this day. So I've been living in America for the last 32 years, a very long time in my life, and I happen to know there's a very famous president from the past, Abraham Lincoln, Abe Lincoln. And he gave a very famous speech in this country called the Gettysburg Address. And actually, Abe Lincoln started his speech in base 20. He started his speech with the words, four score and seven years ago. And then went on and on and on. Four score and seven years ago. So here's my question. Four score and seven years ago. How many years ago is that actually? What is four score and seven? And you think about this for a while, I think about what, what, what is he talking about there? And then after a while, you realize that score is actually an old word for 20. So he's actually saying four 20s and seven years ago. Four 20s is 80 and seven. He's actually saying 87 years ago. So Abraham Lincoln was speaking a little bit of base 20 some 150 years ago. When was the Gettysburg Address? I don't know my American history. Okay, and then, oh, oh, while I'm at it, I happen to know French is very interesting. How do you say 87 au français? Now, I don't speak French at all, but I do believe that the French actually say quatre ma set, which is literally word for word, four twenties, seven. Four twenties and seven, just like Abraham Lincoln, four twenties and seven. So the French have a little bit of base 20 still in their um, language to this day. All right. So we in, a, in, the, in uh, this part of the Western world, the US and Australia, so I'm thinking very much base 10. Some cultures went base 20. But I need to point out that some cultures actually went base 12 in their history. They said 12 was a very natural number for humans to count to. 12? 12, where did that come from? Now, this is actually interesting, this one, because people realize there's actually a very natural way to count to 12 on one hand. And you will see this to this day. This is still a very popular way to count to 12, in, in, to count in some parts of the world, um, particularly parts of Asia, Southeast Asia and India. So people notice that you have four long fingers, each naturally divided into three parts. And a very handy pointer, this thumb. And people count like this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Beautiful. Have you seen some of your students actually count that way? It is still actually being done. People do count to 12 on one hand. And actually, you go to both hands. I just did one group of 12. Now I'll do another group of 12. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Oh, that was two groups of 12. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Oh, that was three groups of 12. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. That's four groups of 12. I can actually get to 12 groups of 12 on two hands which is amazing, which means I can actually count up to 144 on my digits. Wow. So some cultures actually went to base 12, maybe because they were thinking 12 was natural for us humans. That's kind of cool. But actually, actually 12 is really good in everyday life. And you still see 12 to this day in matters of trade and measures and so forth. Okay, I'm making a very messy board technique here. here. So don't practice my board technique as a teacher. I'm illustrating how not to be a good teacher, board technique. The thing about 12 comes up a lot. Um, I'm in America, they have not gone metric, and, but I'm sure everyone remembers how many inches are in a foot. Inches in a foot, why? It's 12. Um, how many hours in a day? 
Now, warning, warning. I mean this literally. How many hours are in a day? And think about ancient history here. A day. What was the very first type of clocks that people had? Whoops, my camera's going out of focus. And you realize people first measured time in sun, with sundials. And sundials only work in daylight. So people only measure time for the daylight hours. And this is true, I believe it was the ancient Egyptians said, okay, let's divide the daylight hours into 10 hours. Well, they had 10 main hours, but they're a little bit nervous about the fuzzy sunrise hours, that sort of twilight. Is that daylight or not daylight? And the sunset times, also another twilight area where the daylight's a bit fuzzy. So they said, actually, let's have 12 hours, two for the twilight regions and 10 main hours. So it was actually the ancient Egyptians that said, let's have 12 hours in a day. And then when people started making you know, water clocks and mechanical clocks, they could start measuring time during the night as well. They said, well, if you've got 12 hours in a day, we might as well have 12 hours in a night as well. So actually, we start saying there's 24 hours in a day. But the answer to this literal question is 12 again. It's 12 again. And in fact, this 12 again in this number, which we still use all the time today. How many items in a dozen? It's 12. And the reason why 12 is such a good number in everyday life for like issues of measuring things or, um, or trade is that 12 is a good compatible number for some basic fractions that come up every time in, in when you go to the market. Like sometimes I want to buy half a bag of flour or maybe I want to buy a third of a pound of sugar or maybe I want to buy a quarter of a dozen eggs. And 12 is a really good number for that. In fact, we do sell eggs in dozens. Look at that, there's an American egg carton. There it is, dozens, 12 eggs. And if I want, say, half a dozen, that's a good whole number of eggs, a nice solid number. That would be six eggs. That's 12 is very good for the fraction half. For the fraction third, oh, that'll be four eggs, a good whole number of eggs. The number 12 is very happy with the number third. And the number quarter, if I want quarter of something, that's three eggs, a good whole number. So 12 is very friendly for the numbers one half, one third, and one quarter. Very basic fractions that often come up in everyday life. The number 10, on the other hand, well, it's okay if it's half. Half of 10 is five, that's fine. A quarter of a 10 is getting scary, scary. And a third of a 10 is ugh, horrible, horrible. Third of a 10 is a nasty number. So actually, this is probably why many quarters went with 12 because they could count to it on one hand and in everyday life, it makes basic um, work at the market work really well. 12 is a very handy number. All right, so we've got 10-ness, and we've got 20-ness, and we've got 12-ness. So I guess we are working in a system where we need to focus on the number 10. So we'll work in base 10, though actually, I need to point out another thing about English, because English is weird. Look how we even call the numbers here. I actually wrote out the names of the first 20 numbers. And if you look at this, it's kind of unusual because you've got these very special words. Each word here is its own word, 10, 11, 12. We use a base 10 system. So we actually focus on the base 10, how we write numbers like 273 is based on 10-ness. Yet look at this. We gave the first 12 numbers their own special names. The first 12 of them, we seem to consider special. So we still have a sense of 12-ness in English. We like the 12-ness. We think that's actually very special. So we gave the first 12 numbers their own special names. Then after we go from 12, we then go to system. We say 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So we have a special system for all the numbers up to 20. Now, the reason I stopped there is because actually we stopped there. We literally stopped there. We never use a suffix like teen again because we actually then change systems after the number 20. So we realized that, okay, we work in base 10. We have special names for the first 12 numbers. We're still obsessed with 12-ness. And we actually think 20-ness is kind of cool. So we've got a system up to 20. But then after that, we change systems because the rest are going to be all lumped together in a system that goes like 21, 22, 23, 24, 31, 32, 33, 41, 42, 51, 52. It's own kind of regimented system after 20. So we've got a special system up to 20 and then we change thereafter. Okay, so look at this. This is really actually very confusing. This is why every student should be absolutely befuddled and confused by numbers because English language just give you, gives you zero clues of what's going on in our number system. We work base 10, we use special words up to 12, we use a special system up to 20, then we change systems after 20. Good luck, good luck, English is weird. Do you know what? It gets weirder.
it gets weirder. This is kind of fun. Let's have some fun. So I was talking about today with things like 273 and 233 and 213. Oh, camera, please camera. There we go. Okay. All right. So, oh, come on camera. Forgive me, I'm fussing. The nature of the Zoom world. There we go. So we would say 273. Uh, 73. By the way, in America, in classrooms, you're not allowed to say the word and right there. They've taken that out. They deliberately take that out. Even though in British English, that's fine. But American English, it's, they, they, it's optional. They've decided to take this out because it's confusing. I wonder what the state is in Australia. I'm kind of curious. If we could chat about that, I'd love to know. Anyhow, but I'll move on. You would never say 223, would you? They may have put a vertical bar there. That would be just too silly. Even though I could actually draw it, it would be this. It would be this. It would be the ones, tens, hundreds, 200, 12 T. There it is. And three. Totally fine. It'll be two hundreds, 12 tens, and three. Fact, actually, I would call that 12 T. I'm even saying the same correct thing, 12 tens. Now, people think that's silly. James, don't be silly. No one says 223, because actually 10 of these tens, 10 of them, kaboom, is really the same as 10 tens. Let's get rid of them. It's the same as one extra hundred. It's really the same as 301 T3. Uh, 2T3, sorry, 2T3. Okay, fine. But I need to point out how fickle English is. Because in old English, about 1,500 years ago, around the 700s, people spoke old English. They actually had a word for 12T. That was actually considered okay, that sort of thing. Not literally the word 12T, a word that's equivalent to that. And it literally meant 12 tens, 120. You could go to the market and say, I would like to buy 12 tea eggs, please. And they'll say, yes, sir, you may have 12 tea eggs and you'll be handed 120 eggs. So English won't let me say it today, but one point they did, English is fickle. 211 tea three, that's kind of fun too. In fact, old English did have a word equivalent to 11 tea, 11 tea three, bingo, which I guess is really, oh, can you see the mind's eye? Most people won't let me say 211 tea three, but 10 of these, 10 tens is one of those. Can you see in your mind's eyes, really the same as 313, which is what society would say. Oh, 313. Oh, this is so weird. It won't let me put 11 dots in that box, but it will let me say as though there are 13 dots in this one. English, make up your mind. You're all over the place. You're all over the place. Whoa. So old English would say 11 T. Old English would say 12 T. I do believe there was a famous author, Tolkien, who actually had his hobbits use the words like levity, 12T, and Levinses and all the rest. So, so um, Tolkien was actually playing with Old English and how he wrote his, his novels there. Um, beautiful. It gets worse. It gets even worse. How does anyone learn maths in English? I do not know. But let's go wild. Let's go up to the thousands place this time. So let's do the ones, the tens, the hundreds, and the thousands. And this time, I want to put... 12 of these. I want to have 12 thousands. Come on camera. Come on camera. Uh oh, I'm heavy. There we go. There we go. There we go. 12, 12 thousands. I also want 12 hundreds. I also want 12 tens. And please give me 12 ones. If I was right, the number 12, that's okay, rather than draw little dots. So think about that. Imagine, since I can't hear you and see your chat, say out loud if you're in the room by yourself, how could you possibly pronounce that number that has 12 thousands? and 12 hundreds, and it has 12 tens, and it has 12 ones. How much you say that number out loud? If you're just gonna be quirky. And while you're saying it, I'll attempt to write it so you see what I think. There, I had a go at it as well. 12,000, 1200, and 12 T12. Yeah, I might put an and in there. It feels like I want to put an and in that one. 12,212 12 T12. 12. Yep, 12,212 12 T12. 12. 12 thousands, there they are. 12 hundreds, there they are. 12 T, 12 tens, there they are. And 12, there it is. Now, listen to that. Most of that sounds okay to our ears. It does feel okay to say 12,000. That doesn't feel strange. We do sometimes say 12,000, but we often say 12,000. 1,200. We often say 1,200. That just sounds okay to our ears. That sounds okay. That sounds okay. 12T, don't be silly, James. No one in their right mind says 12T. And 12. And we often say and 12. 
the crazy thing here is that most of this, in fact, three quarters of this, is sounds okay to our ears, 12,420 to 12. So English is all over the place. It will allow me to have more than 10 items in this place. It will sometimes have, let, let me have more than 10 items in this place. Don't have more than 10 items in that place. Do you have more than 10 items in that place? English is all over the place. Now, think about it. If society doesn't like what I've written here, what can we do to fix up this, this answer for society's sake? Now, it could be kind of fun. I'll give you a moment, try to figure out how could I convert what's written here to the number that you'd expect to see, I don't know, written on a page. What number is this really? 12,000s, 1200s, 1210s, and 12 ones. So I'll give you a little moment to just try that out, and then I'll give away my thoughts. James, just to let you know, oh, yeah. if I can access the chat, but I can't type in our chat, but I can tell you that someone said 11 billion is her favorite number. 11 billion? Yes. yes. Excellent. Someone else said, has anyone experienced doing exploding dots? With oh, I wonder. This is what I'm kind of doing in a sort of an yeah. oblique way. Yes. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> 11 billion. That's a lot. Okay, you put 11 dots in the billion box. So you've got 11 items in that one box. Oh, ho, ho. So, as again, it's all over the place. Yeah, right. Because because in maths, we teach kids, no, no, no. You can't have more than 10 ones because 10 ones is 10. So don't do, take 10 of these, I guess two get left behind and make an extra one there. So this is now really 13 dots there or 13 items in that box. Now I'm going a bit fast now, but hopefully this is okay. So the answer is really 12, 12, 13, two, but you can't have 13 items in a tens place because 10 of those items, leaving three behind, 10 tens makes an extra one of those. So I really now have 13 of those. So the answer is 12, 13, three, two. No, 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 you can't have 10 hundreds because 10 hundreds is really 1,000. So take 10 of those and leave three behind and make an extra one there. Oh, oh that makes 13, great. So now I've got 13, three, three, two. Oh, you can't have 13 items in a place value. Don't be silly, James, because 10, oh, 1,000 is really the same as, oh, here we go, one ten thousand. So I've now got one of those and three of these left behind. So the answer is one ten thousand, three thousand, three hundred, three tens and two. But look how we say that number. You don't ever say 10,000 out loud. We say 13,332. My point is English is so inconsistent and fickle. I have no idea how we're meant to teach young students how to make sense of this. This is crazy because we say 13,332, but we don't write 13,000. We write 110,332 and don't say it. This is insane. All right, so since someone mentioned exploding dots, you can tell where I'm going with this because that's part of the title of the talk. You know, my point is, if society is going to be inconsistent and fickle and quirky all over the place, let's now use that quirkiness to our advantage. As teachers, as personal mathematicians, as adults, our own, our own selves, let's use that quirkiness to our advantage. If society is willing to be quirky, then let's be quirky too, and let's go all the way with it. Because then it's going to make our lives easier. For example, right off the bat, let's do an addition problem. Let's do something like, I don't know, 358 plus 174. Here is my answer, just not with no regard to what society expects, just do what's the obvious thing to me as a mathematician. I, I think the answer is three plus one is four, uh, five plus seven is 12, eight plus four is 12. The answer is 412 to 12. Beautiful, done. But I'll even show you I'm right. I am absolutely right. I am I'm being as bold enough to assert I am actually correct. Because what I've just done here, I've got ones, tens, and hundreds. So there's a little chart of place value. I've got 358. And I meant to add to it, oh, 134. Add one more hundred. Okay, one more hundred. Add seven more tens. Piece of cake, seven more tens. Here they are. And add four more ones. Four more ones. Beautiful. And what do I have? I really have four hundreds. Yes, I do. I really have uh, oh, God, gee, uh, 12 ones. Yes, I really have tens. I have 12 tens and I do have 12 ones. The answer is absolutely for sure 412 T12. There's nothing mathematically wrong with that answer. It's actually correct. It's actually correct. Now, it's just that society thinks it's weird. People don't like me saying 412 T12. All right, so the question now is, what is this answer really in society's speak? Society thinks, wants me to change the answer. Okay, society, if you're gonna be that demanding, I'll change it for you. But since we seem to have the chat working, type into the chat, 
what you think that number truly is in a way that society will accept you to say. I'm curious what you type in. So, Anne, have we anything coming in or not at this point? All right, we've got some delays. 500, 532? Oh, that was in my head, too. I was about to write down 532. <laughs> 532. You brilliant folks. Yes, yes, 532. <laughs> because you're right. Most people say, no, 10 of these is really the same as one of those. Okay, I see the two. Uh, we've got 10 of these. Uh oh, uh, my, my techniques are going to be bad. 10 of these. Is really the same as one of those. Yep, three behind. And that leaves five, 532, 532. Yes, society likes that answer. Society doesn't like that answer. But actually, as a mathematician, I'm going to assert, well, here's my stamp of approval, that both answers are correct. It's just a style thing at this moment. There's nothing mathematically wrong with that answer. There's nothing mathematically wrong with that answer. Both answers are solid and good. It's just a matter of societal preference at this point. By the way, I actually kind of like my approach. So I don't know if you, you noticed here, I remember being very cute, uh, confused back in Australia, back in Adelaide, when I was going through my schooling in the 70s, yep, 70s, how I was being taught to read left to right in every class, except maths class. Maths class said, no, no, you wouldn't do this left to right, James. Don't be silly, you do it right to left. I thought that was strange. I thought it was very strange. Because what you, I don't know if you saw me, when I first did this problem, I actually did go left to right, just like I was taught to read. I went... 3 plus 1 is 4, 5 plus 7 is 12, 8 plus 4 is 12, 4 to 12 to 12, left to right, done, piece of cake, stamp of approval, correct, full marks. Now, if you go right to left, here's how you have to do it. Do it. You go 8 plus 4, the answer is 12. You can write 12 there. It is correct to write 12 there. But some people say, no, no, don't write 12 there. Let's actually know society is going to be more demanding than that. You say, no, no, just write 8 plus 4 is 12. But you know that 10 ones is really an extra one of those, and you'll have two left behind. So what you're really doing is you're what, I don't know what you call it, grouping, carrying, I don't know what the words are. I call it exploding. I say 10 dots explode away, become one dot over there. So whatever your language is, you know that you'll be, have two left behind and you'll make an extra dot there like I did over yonder if you watch my picture. One plus five for seven is 13. You can totally write 13 there. It's absolutely correct to write 13. Absolutely correct. But most people say, no, 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 just, just write the three there because 10 or tens is really the same as one of those. And now I've got five. So the right to left approach, the standard algorithm, just has you go right to left and do all the carrying as you go along. Great. I like going left to right and doing all my carrying afterwards. So do the carrying as you go along, fine. Do the carrying afterwards, fine. All is good and correct. Most people don't realize that all good and correct mathematics is, lo and behold, good and correct, all of it. <laughs> That's fine. It's just a style thing. Whatever floats your boat, go for it. As long as you can explain what you're doing so other people follow you as well, you're golden. You're absolutely golden. All right, here's a yes, no question. On your ownsies, do you want to try this addition problem? Please say no. Please type in no. Please type in no. Please, please, please type in no. You don't want to do it. <laughs> I have a feeling since, since my, my person, my, my, my host here is looking, making faces while she's reading in chat. You do want to do it. Okay. The James Tandon answer, of course, is three, yeah, yeah. 18, 17, 12, 6, 9, 8, 17, 18, and 11. Great. Done. Full set of approval. I'm finished as a mathematician. I'm not going to do any more. I don't like hard work. Now it's just a matter of pleasing society because society doesn't like that answer. And you can fix it up. For example, that's 17 there. They say, no, 10 of these is really the same as one of those, leaving seven behind. So it's really three, 19, seven, 
twirl, six, and off and off. You can fix it up. So I'm gonna leave it to you to fix it up if you so desire. Good luck, good luck. <laughs> okay, but you know at this point, you'll just be pleasing society. There's nothing mathematically wrong with that answer. So it's just, just be aware, society is very demanding, very demanding. You're not doing maths there, you're just doing societal work right there. Actually, actually, while we're at it, this is kind of fun. We just did addition. You can also do multiplication this way. This is kind of, this is really cool. Two, eight, seven, four times three. What do you think is the James Tanton, I don't have any regard for what society expects answer to this question. What do you think is the James Tanton answer to this question? Two, eight, seven, four times three. And see if you can figure out a way to type into chat because that might be tricky typing into chat. Good luck. Someone said pass. <laughs> pass. Good answer. <laughs> I like that answer. It's probably what the answer is no, I don't want to do it. <laughs> All right. What's the, the, what's the least way, work way to do it? What's, the, what's just a mathematically correct way? Not worry about what society thinks. That's my type of answer. Um, someone said laziness. Oops. Um, laziness is no good. I've lost the chat. Um, unless it's carried out. <laughs> <laughs> Lazy is no good. Let's get right. Okay. Here's my definition of a mathematician. A ma I, would, I, I say this a lot. A mathematician is someone who works very hard to avoid hard work. She or he will sit back and mull, really mull for ages. Like, how could I avoid doing hard work? Because this one seems horrible. I don't want to do this. No one in the right mind really wants to do that. So, what could I do to avoid the hard work? That's the sign of a mathematician, working very hard to avoid hard work. Yeah. And I would argue that's not actually laziness. I say that's intelligence. That's great. Yeah. One, one response thinking like James Tanton is 6, yep. 24, 21, 12. Oh, I can see exactly where that's coming from. Maybe I'll put little vertical bars in it. So you may put spaces in it in the chat or something like that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, because actually if you think about this, you really think about what this is. Two thousands, eight hundred, seven tens and ones. Two of these, eight of these, seven of those and four of those. And I'm being asked to, what, triple everything. Please triple. Well, the obvious thing is if I've got two thousands, I'm asked to triple them. Of course, that makes six thousands. Common sense. If I've got eight hundred, I'm asked to triple them. Oh, that makes twenty four hundred. Common sense. If I've got seven tens, I'm asked to triple them. That, that makes twenty one tens. Just triple seven tens makes twenty one tens. And four ones tripled makes twelve ones. Beautiful. The answer is indeed that. Okay, here's the fun part. How do you say that answer out loud? Try it on your own. You can't type that into chat, and this is audio <laughs> chat. <laughs> Try saying it out loud. Let's have some fun. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll give it a go. 6,2421T12. 6,2421T12. That's pretty good, actually. Most of that sounds okay. 6,000 sounds great. 2,400, fine. 21, T, a little bit weird, and 12. Sure, most of it's okay. Now, of course, you know what the next question is going to be. If you, if you had a student write this on an exam, they'll probably be like, well, I've had that paper ripped up or something like that. So that student better fix that up for society's sake. How could you fix this answer for society's sake? Ugh, do you want to? I personally don't want to. But maybe you do. Does anyone in chat want to give me what the actual answer is in societal language? Is that a curiosity? I'm feeling lazy now. Well, actually, I think I can see what the answer is. Eight thousand six hundred and twenty-two. I agree. I agree. I can kind of see that. Actually, when you do this after a while, you actually kind of see what's going to happen. You just like start actually getting. Actually, you get quite good at this. Amazing. Just I actually see these pictures in my head. But then you start playing with them just with the numbers. So I'm actually visualizing. I usually draw dots, dots and boxes. Great, great. This is brilliant. Oh, so I was talking about my education back in Australia. Let me um, point out something that was very confusing to me as a kid. To so do something like 242 times 10. I was told this rule. To multiply, multiply by 10, add a zero. I think I was literally told something like that. And I thought... What? That makes no sense. To do 242 times 10, you meant to add a zero. Okay, 242 plus zero equals 242. I mean, I literally interpreted it that way. You told me to add zero in some sense, so I added zero and it's the same number. That's ridiculous. What are you on about? Of course, they didn't mean that. 
are you, and we all know they meant to, I don't know what the word would be, append a zero or, you know, stick a zero on the end of the digits or something like that. So, so the language here is be careful, be careful of the language there, because literally to add a zero is to add zero and you'd be nowhere involved. Okay, fair enough. But here's the qu real question. This is the more interesting one. I don't care what the answer actually is. Why? Why do you just append a zero? Why does multiplying by 10 end up just appending zeros? Okay, and you think about this, well, this dots and boxes picture, I really kind of love it. I really love it. Here's goes, here goes. Let me draw a lots of lots of this. So the ones, tens, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, and so on and so on and so on. I'm asked, asking for 242, 242. And I say, please, oh, uh, dec what's the word? Not triple, not quadruple, not, not pentuple, dec decuple this one. Make it 10 times as big. Well, the obvious answer is, oh, if I've got two hundreds and I make them 10 times as big, it'll be 20 hundreds. If I've got four tens, I want 10 times as many of them, it'll be 40 tens. If I've got two ones and I want 10 times as many of them, I'll have 20 ones. The answer is 20 hundred, 40 T, 20. Very weird, very weird. So the question is now I've got to fix up this answer for society's sake, because society doesn't like that. And you say to yourself, oh, well, okay, 20, that's really a group of 10 and a group of 10s, so that's two 10s. Oh, but 10, oh, you don't do 10s, you do 10 hundreds is another thousand. So that's really, uh, a group of 10 makes one of these, a group of 10 makes one of those, I've really got two of those. Oh, 10, 10, 10, and 10. Four groups of 10 is really four of these. Oh, okay, great, 10 and 10. Oh, that's really uh, none of these left behind and two of those. What's really happening here is not that you're appending a zero, in some sense, the answer was 20, 40, 20. When you do all the carries, you're kind of just revealing a zero. So actually what's happening is you're revealing a zero. That of course, 20 units is like 10 units, 10 units make two tens. Uh, 40 tens is four, 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 uh, 10, 10, 10, 10 is four hundreds. You're just like in some sense shifting the digits and revealing a zero. So it's not actually adding a zero, that's silly. Uh, it's not really like, appending a zero actually, though that's the effect in terms of the script, it's really kind of revealing a zero in some sense. Kind of cool, kind of cool. All right, but we're having loads of fun. At least I am, since I can't read what's being written in the chat and Anne might be very be very polite, but here goes. Um, actually, actually, this is kind of fun. Let's, let's, let's really keep going, I have an idea. Here's a very simple question. 1,302 from camera times three. Now, I think the James Tanton answer and the societal answer actually agree this time. The answer I can think you can see is uh, 1,000 will become 3,000s, 3 300s will become 900s, zero tens become zero tens, tripled, and six uh, twos and ones become six ones, three, nine, zero, six. All right, all right. So what I did there was literally this. Let me draw a picture of what actually happened. I gave us the number one, three, zero, two, there it is, one, three, zero, two, messy board technique. And then I said, please triple everything. I literally tripled that dot. Instead of 1,000, I now have 3,000s. I actually tripled this dot. Instead of one of these, I had three of them. Instead of one of these, I had three of them. So one of these, I now have three of them. So 300s became 900s. Nothing here to triple. Nope, nothing there to triple. Nothing got tripled. And two of these, one gets tripled, one gets tripled, makes six of them. I was literally tripling the dots I see in the picture. And that gave me the answer times three, three, nine, zero, six. All right, now, now, pretend you saw none of that. Suppose I give you three, nine, zero, six first. So pretend you saw none of that. Don't look, don't look, it's gone away. You saw three, nine, zero, six. And suppose I asked you, oh, what got tripled to give the answer 3096? Can I do the multiplication backwards? Can I undo the multiplication? People call that division. So if I asked you, here's a picture of 3906, what got tripled to give me that picture? And you look at it for a while and say, well, hang on, hang on. If I look at this picture, clearly a dot there got tripled. One dot there got tripled. What else got tripled? Well, clearly one dot there got tripled and another dot there got tripled, and another dot there got tripled. Uh, here's a, a dot that got tripled, and here's a dot that got tripled. So as I'm looking for groups of three in a picture of 3906, all the things that got tripled, and I see that, oh, 
One dot got tripled at the thousandth level, three got tripled at the hundredth level, none got tripled at the tens level, and two got tripled at the, at the ones level. It must have been one, three, zero, two that got tripled. And lo and behold, it was, because that's what we did. My point is, I can kind of undo multiplication in the picture and start doing division. This is actually really kind of cool. And let me do another one. Let me do another one. This might start hurting our brains. Let's see. Let's do this slowly. 426 divided by 2. I'm asking what got doubled to give me 426. And I'm sure you're probably thinking, what, 213. Let's well, pretend we didn't know that. We can't see that yet. So what got doubled to give me 426? I'll draw a picture of 426. There's 426. What got doubled? So I'm looking for groups of two. Well, there's some, a dot that got doubled. There's a dot that got doubled. Oops, my camera's slow. There we go. Uh, oh, there's a dot that got doubled. Oh, there's a dot that got doubled. There's a dot that got doubled and a third dot at that level got doubled. So two dots at the hundreds level got doubled, one dot at the tens level got doubled, and three dots at the ones at the level got doubled. It must have been that two, one, three got doubled. We're doing division. Oh my goodness. All right, clever ones. Try this one on your ownsies. 416 divided by four. I'm sure the answer is meant to be what, 104? Can you draw me a dots and Box's picture to show me that 416 divided by four really is 104. Can you do it? Or is there a hiccup? Hmm. Okay, I'm doing bad board techniques, so forgive me for being squinchy here. Some people have commented that this is really powerful, James. I agree. I agree it's powerful. Hmm. In fact, you know what? 6.4, no, 4.6, actually, I'm sure it's more than two. 4.6 million students across this planet have been doing this. Do you remember this picture from Tanzania? This is a young student doing something, some long number, oh, three, 31,824 divided by 102. She is actually working out that long division problem, but is drawing a picture. This is her picture. Um, this is in Tanzania, um, in a classroom of like 90 kids, and all they've got is a scratchy chalkboard, and she is doing it. She's actually doing it. This is so powerful. And actually, millions and millions of teachers across this planet and their students have been doing this in the Global Math Project. Yeah, but hang on. But, but best not distract me, because I think there's a hiccup on this one. I'm looking for groups of four. So I'm looking for, literally, I'm going to draw it, four dots. Groups of four, four dots. And I can see one right there that's just staring me in the face. Great, one at that level got quadrupled. I can see another group of four there that got quadrupled. Okay, so there's that. And you know what? I don't see any more groups of four. I don't see any other dots that got quadrupled. And I'm starting to get panicky. I'm starting to get worried. And you know what? I love these moments in class because there's no way that we need to teach kids what, how to work out 416 divided by four on a piece of paper anymore. Anyone in the right mind that really want to know the answer would actually get out a calculator. I'm sorry, we live in the 21st century. Let's just type it in. So teaching maths at this point is not about getting answers. It's about thinking. It's about the numeracy behind the thinking. It's about the power of thinking and the confidence for problem solving. Because I've just given you a problem, like the math salute. You kind of know the answer is meant to be 104, yet I'm not seeing it. This is my greatest gift to the world. I think, well, this is what I wish would be the best gift to the world. If we could teach students when they, when they have a problem to be their honest human selves, have an emotional reaction. I said I got scared and nervous and got panicky because I don't see it, I'm panicking. That's an honest human reaction. Math is human, you're meant to be a human reacting to it. So be scared, acknowledge your emotions. That's absolutely being human, fabulous. That's the first step in problem solving, acknowledge your human reaction. Step two, take a deep breath, and do something, do something nonetheless. If we could teach the world to have the confidence, despite their emotional reactions, to take a deep breath and do something, what a gift for the world that would be. You know, who knows what the something could be? You might just want to draw another picture, go for a little walk, put it down and go aside. Go look, go type into a calculator, see what the calculator says, see if you can learn anything from that. Just do something. And after a while, this is a bit of a one-way conversation, it's just me talking to you, you might think, 
oh, I could do something with that one dot there. Because so we realized that was really came from 10 dots over here that must have carried or grouped or, and I would say exploded, kaboom, and made one dot there. Let me undo it. Ooh, undo it, crazy. Let's say it's 10 dots here. Because then suddenly I start to see loads more groups of four. One. Well, I can start using my Aussie lingo again. It's been a while. Loads. I don't think lots of. I use four. I can see four lots of four. I can say four lots of four now. In America, I have to say four groups of four. Four lots of four. There they are. Brilliant. And lo and behold, one zero four. I see that one zero four is what got quadrupled. Powerful, powerful indeed. Yeah. James, there's a couple of questions or comments on the chat about remainders. <gasps> then let's do it. Good answer. Good question. The answer to that is always let's do it. So what would happen if I did 417 divided by 4? What would the picture be then? And you say, okay, I was just throwing away my piece of paper already. It'd be the same work I just did, essentially four dots, one dot, come on camera, come on camera, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You say, okay, I find a group of four. I find a group of four. I have a panic moment. I have a little weep. I feel my emotions. I acknowledge it. I say it out loud. Take a deep breath. Or well, maybe I can still unexplode. I can still undo this. I suppose it's called, what's that called? Borrowing? Is that what it's called in the jargon? I, I don't know. Different curriculums say different things. Undo that. Undo that dot there and do make it 10 here, like we did before. There's 10. Oh, well, I can see loads more groups of four. Oh, my goodness, fabulous. A group of four, a group of four, another group of four. Lots of dots got quadrupled. Oh, and one left over. So I see it's really 104 groups of four with one dot left over. Well, what is that one dot? Well, one dot left over. I guess we write remainder one, one left over remaining. Um, oh, when I grew up in Australia, we had to write capital R, remainder one. And in America, I think most people write with small r. What do people write in Australia now for the remainder? What's the standard thing? I think R1. Big R or little R? Um, or it depends which school of thought you come from. <laughs> doesn't matter. Okay. I think some countries write dot, dot, dot one, by the way, mm. which is weird. Um, so different countries do different things. Well, here's what mathematicians would write. Mathematicians write it's 104 plus one dot still waiting to be divided by four. Please divide me by four. So you actually say it's 104 and a quarter. So depending mm. on where you are, the curriculum you might want to write it that way. Yeah. 104 and a quarter. Yeah. Oh, the chat saying, yeah, chat saying small r. Small R is the most common thing in Australia. Okay, it's funny. Yeah. So did it switch in the last yeah. 50 years of my life? Oh yeah. my goodness. Okay. Or okay. convert to fraction, as you said. Bingo. One more dot waiting to divide by four. So if you, my point is, if there are remainders, you will literally see them. We literally saw that dot we couldn't do anything with. We literally saw it. Whoa, whoa. Okay, okay. I see I have nine minutes left. I wanted to leave a question and answer session, but I cannot resist. Let's do a juicy one. Let's end off today with a juicy one because I was doing single digit division. Let's get scary. You guys are obviously ready for it. 276 divided by 12. Let's do a multi digit division. All right. So, what I'm asking for is what got 12 or 5? What got multiplied by 12 to get the answer 276? Or how many groups of 12 can I see in 276? So, we draw a picture of 276. One, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, 276, there it is. And let's be really clear, what does 12 look like? Now, 12 would literally be 12 dots in a box, which in James Tanton world is fine. Except society doesn't like 12 dots in a box. It's demanding to say, no, no, 10 of these would actually like boot over, disappear, leave two behind and bump one dot over. So here's the annoying thing about 12. It literally is 12 dots, except society says, no, no, no. It'll be 12 dots there in this rightmost picture, but there'll be some spillage because 10 explode, kaboom, and become one, one place over, which is annoying, which is annoying. Society is actually very annoying, by the way. That is demanding. I'd much rather just see 12s, but it doesn't. What we're actually looking for is one dot next to two dots. One dot next to two dots. Okay, so, so here's my point. I'm gonna be absolutely honest here. Um, uh, the point of this exercise is not to get the answer. So if, I, if the only goal was to get answers and no one in their right mind would do anything about what I'm doing right now, let's just see what the answer is, 23. 
So if the goal was to get the answer, do what a smart 21st, citizen of the 21st century would do is pull out a calculator. The real question is, which is much more interesting, how do you get that answer? Let's do the mathematical thinking. Let's do the numeracy. Let's actually think about this. This is kind of cool. Now, well, 12 dots is really one dot next to two dots. Do you see any one dot next to two dots in this picture, anywhere in this picture? And you stare at this for a while, and this is kind of puzzling, but you say, well, actually, I do. There's one dot next to two dots. I'm going to draw as a funny loop this time. You think about it. Well, hang on, hang on, hang on. In that loop, where are the 12 dots actually? We think about it, they all must have been here in the right part of the loop. And 10 of them went kaboom and spilled over. So actually all 12 dots are really at that level and spilled over. Okay, so I found one group of 12 in this picture. Do I see any other one dots next to two dots? And lo and behold, there's another one underneath it. And where are all 12 dots? They must have been here in this box right here and went kaboom, spilled over. Because society is demanding. It wants the spillage all the time. Ah, society. Do you see another one dots next to two dots? Why, yes, one dot next to two dots, right there. At this level, where are the 12 dots? They must have all been here, and kaboom, spilled over, because the side is demanding. Any other one dots next to two dots? Why, yes. Another one, they must have all been there, kaboom, and spilled over. And finally, one dot next to two dots, I'm getting a bit weird in my picture here, but that's okay. They must have all been here, another one at that level, 12 dots right there, kaboom, spilled over. So actually, I see it. It must have been tw uh, two dots at the tens level and three dots at the ones level to get me 12 times 23 is 276. 12 groups of, uh, the 23 groups of 12 in a picture of 276. We've just done long division. And if I made this 270, I don't know, 278 divided by 12, I bet you can see exactly in the picture how the picture is going to change. You'll see you'll literally have, oh, extra two dots I didn't know what to do with, a remainder of two. You'll literally see remainders. Welcome, welcome to Exploding Dots. Now, if we could teach this way, when I left the university world, I became a high school teacher because I thought the high school curriculum was the most joyless of all in the US in the 1990s, 2000s. And I actually had to teach my kids how to do polynomial division. This is all base 10. In high school, you do algebra, where everyone's obsessed with the letter X, and you do something called base X, and it's called a polynomial. It's exactly this work. I actually stopped and taught my kids this very lesson I just did with you, my tenth, uh, my year 11s. They were year 11s, I think, year 10, year 11, somewhere out there. I said, let's have this whole story. Do we understand place value? Because the kids could finally see this themselves. And this is high school maths. Instead of doing 1, 10, and 10 squared, 100, we just make it 1, x, and x squared. We've just done this high school algebra problem. 2x squared plus 7x plus 6 divided by uh, 10, uh, 1x plus 2. We just did a quadratic polynomial division problem. What we do in primary school actually is, thank you, primary school teachers. You're doing all my work for me as a high school teacher. And kids can make the natural leap that algebra is just extension of not being locked into being human, obsessed with the number 10. You can do this in any base you like, in base 12, base 20, or even an abstract base x. That's all maths is. Maths is one beautiful connected story. Let's reveal that beautiful human story to our kids. Even the human origins of this. Many kids don't realize we use base 10 because of this. And some cultures went base 20, 12 and 20. Some cultures went base 60. And we have remnants of base 60 to, the, to this day. So I could ramble on and on and on. I've given myself less, uh, three minutes and 15 seconds for questions, other questions. I will answer anything about anything from anyone. Go for it. James, while they're, they're typing in their questions in the chat, mm -hmm. someone asked earlier about any cultures using knuckles. Knuckles? I don't know. I mean, of course, I mean, I was taught as a school kid about the 30, 31 days in a, in a year using knuckles, but that's... Uh, I'm not aware of other cultures, some cultures using knuckles for counting. That's okay. really interesting. Yeah. Mm. By the way, I will tell you, there was a radius bone, the arm bone of a wolf that was found in an archaeological site in Czechoslovakia um, in 1937, dated 30,000 BCE. So it was at least 30,000 years ago, BCE. They had this, had 55 notches. The first 25 were all like this. 
And then it went one, two, three, four, five, 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 one, two, three, four, five. And you look at that and think, oh, someone realized they can make life easier themselves by going into groups of five after a while. And why five? They must have been thinking of the digits of their hands. We humans are so obsessed with our physiology. And even then, caveman, prehistoric man, human kinds were doing this, apparently. <laughs> cool. Got to um, love it. Another question was, how young do you think you could explore this idea with um, students? This is a really good question. Um, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll stop showing things you see me. Well, maybe you can see the other place is showing. Um, this is hard. So what I'm really doing today is I was realizing my audience was aware of place value first. And I was actually bouncing off of those ideas. So I think it's really helpful to have a perspective of what place value is first and then see it in a brand new light. What I've really done for you today is say, take something you thought you knew so well and see it in a brand new light. That's the power of this visual and that really sinks with people. So I've been doing this about year four and up. That's easy. Now, I don't recommend this as the first experience for place value because you can just make this mechanical. You just make this very mechanical and you get kids to do it, but not really internalize it. Now, don't get me wrong. I've now met some fabulous year one, year two, year three, two. So actually do do it with their kids with a deep understanding behind it. So it is possible. It has to be like, you have to think really, really hard about it. Be very careful and something not just mechanical. It really doesn't turn like, so it is, so it is possible. But I just, you know, when I'm doing this for the world as a whole, I, for this global maths project, I just say, look, we're, we're for year four and up. So you've got some previous concept of this and you can bounce up and build off of it. So that's, that's be careful. The answer is yes, all age levels. <laughs> but make sure it's about the understanding, not the mechanics. Mm, thank you. And another one was just about um, um, other videos, et cetera, to explore this further. Well, yes, in the resources, go to Global Maths, Global Math Projects, I'm Americanized, Global Math Project, <laughs> Global Math Project, is that on the screen? Dot org, oop, dot org. And um, yes, and you'll see, uh, want to do something called Exploding Dots? You'll get more Exploding Dots than you possibly even imagine you'd want. And here's the other thing. We've just started, well, I've just started giving live Zoom lessons. If you want me to come visit your classes and give a series of four to six lessons on this sort of stuff, I've been doing this um, with fourth graders and fifth graders and high schoolers so far. And I'm about to do what's called a middle school in Australia and in America. So um, if you ever want James Tan to come visit your class for a series of lessons, I'm up for it. Email me and if we can make it work schedule-wise, we'll make it work. So yes, check out the website. More than you possibly want about exploding lots is there or um, maybe come have the Zoom lessons from James Haddon from America. That could be fun. Thank you, Jam. James. Sadly, our time has is, is, um, expired, so to speak, but you have lots of comments on the chat saying that you've blown my mind. Wow, this is amazing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so <laughs> well, on behalf, check it out. Yeah, so on behalf of the MAV, I'd like to thank you for your, your keynote today. And um, I know my head's spinning as well. And I'd like to also thank the Department of Education for sponsoring your keynote. So we'll take. And I take them too. So thank you very much. And right. Th thank you, James. We'll take a, a short break now. So don't forget to check out the virtual delegate satchel and do touch base with your spo the sponsors and the exhibitors. So the next session starts at twelve at ten twenty five. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>